Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We've got a very special guest today, Jennifer Say. I hope that's how you say it because your website is Say Everything and that would be awkward if it didn't get pronounced that's that way. That's correct. You got it. Good. So how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> got a little snow here in Colorado. Oh, wow. Where, night, but... Whereabouts in Colorado? I'm in Denver. Mm. Well, that's always nice. Uh, snow, I mean. Um, so... For I, I believe a lot of our listeners know who you are just because uh, I've spoken about you before. But uh, give us some background information on yourself, please. Yeah, I'll give you the short version mm -hmm. of the story, as short as I can. Um, I was a longtime Levi's employee. I started there in 1999 as an entry-level marketing assistant and climbed my way all the way up the ladder. Became the chief marketing officer in 2013 and held that role for eight years. Uh, which is a long time. Most people, I think the average tenure in that role is 18 months because mm -hmm. people get fired or <laughs> it becomes clear they're going to get fired. So all that to say, I was good at my job. Um, and then I became the brand president, which is uh, essentially next in line for CEO. And I would have been the first female CEO of the company. I loved the company. I loved the brand. And I stayed for a long time. Uh, but in March 2020, I was outspoken about public school closures in my city, which was San Francisco. It is not anymore, um, as well as the school closures nationally. I mean, public schools um, for half of American public school students were disrupted for two years. Um, and we now see how harmful that's been to children. The headlines are everywhere. But at the time, to even speak of it was heresy. You couldn't. You were accused of everything from being a racist to a conspiracy theorist and a teacher murderer. And I persistently spoke out about it for two years um, in all forms, but certainly social media. I wrote op-eds. I was on the news, that kind of thing, led rallies to get the schools open. And eventually in January 22, I was told um, you have to leave. There's no place for you in this company anymore because of these views that you've expressed. And rather than accept their severance, uh, hush money, I would call it to stay quiet about why I was shoved out the door, I quit publicly and wrote a book and I'm talking to you about why the censorship and bullying and all that stuff, viewpoint discrimination that, you know, left me unemployed after 23 years of loyal commitment to the company. Yeah, it's interesting because um, the the company is kind of rooted in Americana, you know what I mean? It isn't. Oh, yeah. uh, it isn't like a tech company. Uh, the the brothers brought it back. Well, in the 1950s or so. I know a little bit about the history because I I did some bodyguard work for Miss Haas back in the day. Um, oh, interesting. So I got an earful of that stuff back then. Just, uh, yeah, it's super it's interesting. A, it, it's a pretty cool history. Yeah, the company was started in 1853. Mm -hmm. It began as a dry goods store. Levi Strauss was a Bavarian merchant, meaning came from Germany, mm -hmm. uh, to build a better life for himself and his family. And then in 1873. He patented the first blue jean. It's actually the 150th anniversary this year of the blue jean or the 501. Um, so, you know, it has a storied history and it has a history of, I think, doing right by employees, which is something I always valued about working there. Um, and unfortunately, I, I can't say that that is true anymore. <laughs> there was a mantra we used to repeat, um, profits through principles, which was one coined by um a former CEO and family member, Bob Haas, who I, I still have the utmost respect for. And I think if that were true, I, I mean, I loved that phrase, you know, that we could do business and provide great product and do so ethically and treat employees fairly. And, you know, I was reading over your, your principles and number 10, I will place virtue above commerce. That was the reason I chose to work there for so long. But when I did that, really did that in advocating for public school children. Um, I learned very quickly that that mantra was a lie. Yeah, that's always disappointing to find that, uh, you know, somebody you thought was something isn't that thing, right? Um, yeah, it is. And I think, you know, in, in fairness, I think Bob, who had been Bob Haas, who had been the CEO in the 70s and, and 80s, um, I actually think he did do that. I still have tremendous respect for him, but I think he was the last of his kind. And I think it's no longer true, but they like to repeat it as if it is to continue to get the kind of, um, to be celebrated as such, even though 
it's false. It's not true. Sure. Yeah. I always wonder about people in your, so I, um, my career has been such that if anybody tells me what to do, I just tell them to go fuck themselves. Right. Um, which is, you know, it's an, <laughs> it's a nice thing to be able to do, but there's, you, you do place, uh, unless you, you know, own your own companies, you place a ceiling on yourself by doing that. Um, sure. And, uh, I, but I wonder from your perspective, you were operating at a very high level for a very long time. I was. Um, yeah. I mean, I was an executive since 2010, mm -hmm. you know, I was in the executive board, you know, in the boardrooms and executive team meetings for a very long time. I know it, I was in the belly of the, the beast. <laughs> um, but we had no, you know, it, it if the question is, you know, should there have been restrictions placed on the things I could say as an uh, as an executive, I'm not sure that's what you're asking. But um, at Levi's in particular, we had no contract iterating, you know, what we could or couldn't say in social media. I had been very outspoken politically in the past, um, but the things that I expressed were more aligned with the left and kind what, of those views what, put what forth kind by of, the company. What kind of stuff are we talking about? I mean, everything from candidates, and I was critical of, of President Trump, which mm. perhaps some of your listeners are, you know, not so happy with me uh, for having been. I'm always respectful, but, you know, challenging some of the, the things I found troubling. Mm. Um, I was, you know, well, here's, here, here's, here's one, and I guess you could argue this isn't necessarily political, but my, my background, you know, as a child, I was an elite athlete, and I have... I wrote a book in 2008 about the abuse in the sport, and I became very involved in advocating for young athletes across sports mm. in the Olympic movement because of the cruelty, the physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, um, and had been very outspoken about that, which was not well received in 2008. People didn't believe it, and they said I was you know, ruining the names of good men who had coached national teams, whereas I knew that they had sexually assaulted many, many young women, you know, that I competed with on the team. So I had been outspoken about that. I mean, I went to Washington, D.C. and advocated for the Safe Sport Act, which is now in place to protect amateur athletes. So, you know, they were always very supportive of that. I'd written a book. I made a movie called Athlete A, which is on Netflix and won an Emmy. Um, but from their view, that wasn't controversial. Um, so it was OK. And even when I you know, would talk about women's equality, mm. for instance, I did so in a way that was kind of aligned with the with the company's perspective and the interests. And I think, you know, with COVID, to, a lot of people say to me now, I don't really understand it. It's not even controversial to say that schools should have been open. It is hard to convey three years ago and even two years ago how controversial that was. I mean, I, I quite literally might have been the only person in San Francisco other than my husband saying, wait a minute, are we doing harm to school children? And while that should never have been political, you know, and the reason I focused my advocacy on children is I thought that was kind of a bridge builder. Right. Like I thought everybody could agree, let's not hurt the kids. Um, but it was heresy. And I was just bullied at work. I was, you know, called a conspiracy theorist and a racist. How you get to racist from thinking public schools should open is still sort of beyond me. Um, but, you know, that's what I was equated with. And those are pretty unemployable things if true. Mm -hmm. You know, those would indicate you're not a very good leader, <laughs> right. you know, um, if you're discriminating against, you know, portions of your employee population. Um, and and so, you know, it was just it was incredibly controversial to say these things. And I said them in a very diplomatic way, as I am kind of want to do. And mm. it didn't matter. You could not ask a question. Why do you think that about is like a, let me let me ask you a, in a yeah. different way. Why do you think it is that the political uh, influence made its way so deeply into the corporate infrastructure of America. And it isn't just this example. There's a, quite a few examples, but yeah. since you have experience yeah. with this, what, what do you think about that? It's, it's a great question. I think, I think there's a separate question, which is why did COVID and lockdowns and school closures become the sort of identity of the left and a key sort of aspect of their platform? Because in my mind, it's a trespass of the values they claim to, um, you know, to support, but I'll set that one mm. aside for a second. No, I, I agree with that because of nothing more than the downstream effects, right? Uh, exactly. Like taking care of kids in general, but then single parents who can't go to work now 
right? Exactly. I mean, it's really fucking stupid. It's really fucking stupid. And, you know, especially when you think about the fact that, you know, in school for schools in particular, the public schools in San Francisco and in every city and, you know, district across the country, 60 to 70 percent low income children. Mm -hmm. So here the left is claiming that they care about equality of opportunity. Another one of your principles, which I support. And yet the private schools were open. So all of my peers telling me I had to shut up were sending their kids to in-person private school. They weren't too um, afraid of COVID to do that. They knew that their kids suffered well at home. Um, and yet they told me, you cannot advocate for the same for the low-income black and brown students in San Francisco, which included my own children. I, I sent and do send my kids to public school. And so the hypocrisy of that was just so enraging to me um it was such a denial of a basic civil right just like lockdowns impacted small business owners and yet big box stores were allowed to continue to operate you know the downstream effects it's grotesque you know i mean it's morally abhorrent what we what we did it is people yeah and with you, less. people think that um and, and you can address this since you were a uh, c-level executive at, at a very large company people seem to think that mom and pop challenges from underneath, I guess, or a threat to corporate infrastructure. But typically what happens is uh, better ideas happen because they can move quicker than you can at Levi's. And then if it's a great enough product, you fucking buy it. I mean, co cor major right. corporations are right. not it's competition. Yeah. yeah. Major corporations are not afraid of competition. It's and, and if you are, you're stupid. You shouldn't you don't belong in that position because the competition is makes what, you better. It makes you better. It drives innovation. Yeah. It also, uh, again, Levi's, if somebody comes up with a new jean design, I'm pretty sure Levi's can buy it from them. You know what I mean? It's it's not like yeah, this company is pretty, hamstrung. Yeah, or pretty quickly sort of engineer it sure, from yeah. what they see in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And you're right. The smaller companies are more agile and can go quicker and they keep others on their toes. And um, But, you know, what we did to small business owners, I think 50% of small businesses in San Francisco went out of business and mm -hmm. have not yet returned. I mean, it's... Like I said, it's it's morally abhorrent. And meanwhile, we saw the largest upward transfer of wealth in, I think, the history of this country. You know, big tech, big pharma, big box, they all grew like crazy. And yet the little guy um, and gal and the sort of vulnerable child in public school, they were denied their rights and they were sure. the ones who suffered. So I found that just grotesque and I'm, refused to stop talking about yeah. it. But to by, answer your by the way, that's like okay. not that's like knocking down the foundation of your home to make the second floor look better. You know what I mean? That's really stupid. It's, it's, it's myopic at best, but it's uh, incredibly dumb economically to do something like that. Yeah. Can't argue. And what we were, what, what, the, what they were supposed to be satisfied with was getting, you know, a thousand dollar check, which is, you know, what is that going to do? What about the dignity of work? What mm -hmm. about ongoing income? What about ability to take care of your family? Um, what about the fact that to your point, you know, for hourly wage workers and essential workers, their children were left home alone, you know, often without strong Wi-Fi. For some children, school is the place. It's the safe place. You know, it's where there is an adult that supports them and has high expectations of them. And that was all taken away from these sure. kids. Yeah, I mean, if you go into a well-funded area, uh, not well-funded, but if you go into a well-managed, low-income area, you you here's one thing you'll see that a lot of people uh, in the middle and, and upper middle class don't know about kids in impoverished areas will continue to go to school throughout the summer to get two meals a day where they wouldn't That's normally right. get them at home. Right. Like it, th right. this is the thing that drives me crazy. You can't even take care That's of right. fucking kids because of people's politics. That is unacceptable. Exactly. Very well put. And it is why, even though I was opposed to all of it, lockdowns, mandates, everything I kept, I knew what I was saying was controversial, but again, I thought I could bridge a build, build a bridge around children. Like I thought if anything could be not, political we could agree that we do not use children as human shields you know to protect adults that we do not take their entire life away school is a child's life like try to think back we're adults now everything is built around school it's where you figure out who you are and they had no idea when it was coming back so they had no hope mm. yeah i mean that's where the mental health um impacts that we're seeing now and we take every we took every milestone away and people would say what are you whining about? So what? Your kid missed graduation or prom or whatever. You know what? In a young life, that is what a life is made of. All of those key milestones. And when you have no promise and no hope of seeing that come back, you become very despondent as a young person. 
Um, and, you know, we've seen rates of depression, anxiety, and even suicidality increase. I mean, it, anyway, I, I digress. As far sure. as the kind of wokeness taking over mm. capitalism, which I think was the core of sure, your, yeah. your prior question, I think it started in the 2010s, but it really accelerated in 2020, in the summer of, of 2020 with the Black Lives Matter mm. um, protests. Um, what I think it is at its core, it's a, it's a few things. I mean, my cynical view, and I think it's a truthful one because I've been in the boardrooms, is it's 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 an attempt to profit off of you know, the values of Gen Z sure. and millennials. It's, a, it's so affinity based marketing, right? That, I, it, yeah. It's like saying, Hey, I'm a company. My mm. values are the same as yours. You should buy my stuff, but, but the behaviors don't support it. Mm. You know, businesses as it always was, it's about profits. It's about making money. And I'm not decrying that that drives competition. I mean, you should do so and treat employees well, mm. et cetera. What I have an issue with is this lie, this hypocrisy that says we're all for X, Y, or Z. And yet, underneath the covers, you're doing none of that. You know, Nike's a good example. They wave their arms about women's equality. There's so many lawsuits right now about against Nike for harassment, sexual discrimination, not paying pregnant athletes, mm. abusing runners in their running program. Like, I would rather you treat the women in your employ fairly than do a campaign about how much you, you know, support women and Women's History Month, because that's a lie. It's sure. hypocritical. So it's a marketing strategy. But I think the other sort of contributing factor that has changed over the last 20, 30 years is it used to kind of be cool to just be rich. Mm -hmm. That is not anymore, right? Greed is not good. Privilege is bad. You have to denounce your privilege. And these CEOs want to be celebrated. They want to be beloved and they want to be heroes. And so they all sort of denounce their privilege and their two true intentions, which is to make as much money as is possible and pretend that they're social justice warriors and everybody believes it, but they will, they will steal from the company's coffers while, you know, laying off thousands of employees in order to bolster the stock price and take money for themselves while saying they're empathetic. They care about workers. They care about the undercut. They, they don't care about any of those things, but they they love being celebrated as, you know, these social justice warriors. That's an heroes. interesting and theory. I've never heard that before, but that makes sense. They like it, you know, and they like it because their kids like it. Mm. You know, they're very influenced by their children. We're in this whole, you know, I'm not your parent, I'm your friend <laughs> era. Um, and, you know, their kids are a little embarrassed that they were raised with so much money, but they're... Um, you know, they like the fact that their dad might go out there and say he's fighting climate change or racism. Meanwhile, none of them wants to give up any of the money. Or I mean, the give me a jets. break. Yeah. No, none of them wants to give up the private jets that they all flew to, you know, Davos a, a couple mm. weeks ago. And, you know, at Levi's, my own company, we laid off 15% of the workforce under the cover of COVID. And the, the CEO cashed out $43 million in stock. But the headlines read, we're doing this with empathy. Well, what kind of empathy is that? The empathetic thing would have been fight to open the stores and get these people back to work so we could afford to pay them. Mm -hmm. That's empathy for workers. Um, yeah, so why do you think there, I, I don't remember there being um, a very large push from brick and mortar CEO or CEOs there of wasn't. companies that have brick and mortar businesses, like not just, not there just not. online places. Why do you think that is? Because like, they were hemorrhaging money like everybody else, I would imagine. Even though they were giving themselves golden parachutes and shit, they were still losing a lot of money, stock prices oh, yeah. up. Oh, oh, it was brutal. I mean, so, in the so first like few months, the, we the, were down 70%. Like, who hears of numbers like that? You know, I mean, it was crazy. And what does the board say in a situation like that where the guy's like, uh, we're going to lay off the workforce and, but not fight it politically? I, I mean, if it's... It's a great question. Like the tech companies have been pretty active fighting back against Washington, even though I don't think they're correct. And a lot of the things yeah. they do, they still are pretty active. Um, yeah. But why, why did it not happen this time? It's very bizarre to me. Yeah. It, it is somewhat bizarre until you kind of trace it back to COVID and lockdowns and school closures and mandate became a policy of the left. And you have this wave of companies, especially coastal companies, pretending to be of the left so that they are celebrated. And so you could not violate these edicts from the Democratic Party, from Fauci, from Walensky, from the teachers union. You know, you could not violate that party platform without sort of 
revealing yourself to be a hypocrite. It was heresy to challenge public health in the Democratic Party. And they had all pretended to be these, you know, left-leaning heroes who fight for climate change. So I think that's why, but it's a totally fair question. I was always sort of flummoxed by it as well. It's like, we want to fix our business. Let's get the stores open. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it was never, you know, it was never discussed. And yet, you know, it, here's an interesting thing. Um, we certainly didn't shut down, for instance, distribution centers mm. where we were shipping e-commerce product from. So it's like one class of workers we, we, we were willing to sacrifice. I mean, I don't think they were really sacrificed by having to go to work, but you understand, mm. like that was an acceptable compromise. But we couldn't do this public facing thing of saying stores needed to open. Um, you know, and then when they did open, it had to be with all of these, like, you know, the six feet apart dots on the floor and the required masking and all the craziness so that, um, you know, you could continue to feign the stance of, I am a good Democrat because I'm afraid of COVID. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> it's goofy. I mean, look, so th there's, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, I guess, inevitable end state of, regulation in general right um where it's like osha you, you just have all these silly rules that don't actually apply to anything and it did like it's it's you can't govern something like that in mass you know what i mean it just doesn't make a whole right. lot of sense uh, but yeah, yeah I, I do agree with you that people are completely captured by the ideology behind i i think the they I, still are oh yeah i think the hatred for trump played a big role in it because I do too. people get uh, like I criticize, you don't, you don't have to worry about criticizing him. I criticize him all the time. I'll credit. I don't give a fuck who it is or what party or group they belong to. If they're doing stupid shit, then I'm just, I think it's reasonable to say that, but, yeah. um, people got crazy with this dude. Oh yeah. They like, became he's deranged. Like, like he's the fucking boogeyman or something. No, he's just a fucking rich asshole from New York. He's exactly who I, he's yeah. always been. I don't know why people were so surprised by any of this stuff. Yeah, I think they're surprised that Americans elected him, but rather than asking themselves why, and I think there's a lot of lot to be mined there, um, they just turned him into this sort of. Mo it, I mean, it clearly contributed to the increased polarization in the mm -hmm. country and the tribalism. And it's like he was so evil, um, you know. A court. I just thought he was sort of a buffoon who couldn't lead the country very well. I, I mean, I don't really view him as the incarnation of evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, but as it pertains to schools, you know, in the summer of 2020, he said the schools need to open. So, of course, by virtue of who he is, you know, that was never going to happen, sure, at least yeah. not in Democratic states and cities. And the American Academy of Pediatrics, a week before he said this, had said schools need to open. As soon as he said it, what did they do? Walked it back. Right. And they didn't open for more than a year. It was just like anything he did was wrong. And therefore, we have to oppose it with all our might. And whoever we harm. It doesn't matter. It does not matter that we're harming 25 million, half of America's public school children, because he must be stopped by any means necessary. That was the view, I think. And it's it has increased the the polarization in this country. You know, the one other thing I would just add on the on the, the wokeism in corporate America, I think it also helps them or they I, I think it actually does work. It helps them avoid any real scrutiny for anything unethical they may be doing behind the scenes you know, perhaps illegal, like with Sam Bankman Freed, um, or to a lesser extent, just simply unethical. But if you kind of make this big show of being this kind of morally righteous social justice warrior, the press goes along and they print glowing puff pieces and nobody's looking under the covers at what bullshit is happening. Whether you're Sam Bankman Freed, who got away with it for years and years, or Adam Newman, the WeWork guy who mm -hmm. was gonna elevate the world's consciousness, but was just filling his own pockets. Why does the, I mean, the press does not interrogate these issues at all. They do not look at the p and Like all of this is publicly available mm -hmm. information in their company, you know, in the annual reports. And yet the financial press does not, they love championing these, you know, heroic CEOs. Sure. What do you think it is? Um, wh why do you think there's so much scrutiny on social justice stuff in the corporate structure from the media, from the left, et cetera, but very little scrutiny, if any, about their dealings with China and Uyghur concentration camps and things it's like that. It's such a good, yeah, that's such a great question. Um, 
And certainly one we dealt with, you know, a, a very large percentage of the world's cotton is grown mm -hmm. in China. Um, and a, an even more significant percentage of the world's organic and better cotton is grown by the Uyghurs in, mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, Xinjiang province. I think because they really don't give a shit about any of it, you know, and it's like no one wants to give up their iPhone. Mm -hmm. So even though they know this other stuff is happening, it's like we're just going to avoid it and put it over there because that's a sacrifice. It's too right. great to but make. The, but the textile, the U.S. textile industry had a massive impact on China over the last 30 years or so. I mean, uh, working conditions, rates of pay and things like that. It actually got so good that a lot of the manufacturing moved to places like Cambodia and Laos and things like that. Right. Because they, they got priced out. Right. So it's like. That that is kind of the, that's kind of where I yeah. where I'm going with uh, principle ten. Other than just in your own personal life and your own personal business, yeah, uh, it makes a lot of sense to do the right thing, right? Because doing the wrong thing is going to catch up to you at some point. Yeah, you know, I mentioned Bob Haas earlier, mm -hmm. who was a former CEO, and when during his tenure as CEO, he actually refused to enter the Chinese market. And it was right when the China market had opened up, and American companies were kind of racing to get in there because of the financial opportunity, and um, he refused. And he was lambasted for it in the press as you know limiting the growth of the company. But he did it for human rights reasons. You know, he said there are these. It's a human rights disaster. Mm. We're not going to go in and support the policies of this country who, you know, do all the, the whatever, whether it's freedom of speech or slave labor or any of it. He said, we're not going to support, um, you know, a regime and an economy that, that does that. That, of course, quickly went, fell by the wayside when, when, when he was, uh, you know, pushed out as CEO. He, he did really put the principle first, which is why I have a lot of respect and admiration for him. I think... I think that at the end of the day, it's because all of it, the social justice stances by the leaders in the company, they're all they're all fake. So they don't want to shine a light on the China thing. And everyone else becomes sort of, you know, it's like bread and circuses. You know, they throw this stuff at people and journalists and they get distracted by uh, the social justice stuff, the DEI stuff, and they fail to then interrogate the China stuff because they're like, oh, look, they're doing all this good over here. And I think no one really wants, no consumer, no journalist, no one really wants to give up their goods made in China. They don't want to give up their Nikes and they don't want to give up their iPhone. They're more than happy to join the BDS movement and boycott products made out of Israel, of which there are like three and no one misses when you don't buy them like who cares if i can't have a soda stream mm. <laughs> or like couscous from trader joe's it's right. not really a big sacrifice so you know i think it's about the sort of shallowness of their beliefs to begin with um and then of course it gets all twisted up with china because you then they, they twist it up with race and they start saying well if you're anti-china that's anti-asia and it's like no, there's grotesque human rights violations. There's literally slave labor <laughs> happening in, in, in Shandong province with mm -hmm. the Uyghurs. Um, one of the reasons we did not, at Levi's, we had pulled out um, in terms of supply chain mm -hmm. from China because of the lack of transparency. So we had pretty strict terms of great engagement rules about needing to be able to go into a factory, see where stuff was made. And that is not permissible in China. So we had pulled out quite a long time ago, which I think is admirable, but we certainly weren't going to not try to build a business there because the opportunity was too great. Well, especially if you're producing in Vietnam, you can get it over the border tax-free to China. So that's always a nice thing, uh, no yeah. in size tax. Um, from, I don't know how uh, in touch, I guess, you stay with the people that you used to work with back in the day, but... Uh, or, or your colleagues at other businesses and stuff. But do you see anybody in these positions admitting they were wrong this whole time? Because I haven't seen a whole lot of the mea culpas that I would have expected. Zero. There's none. Zero. And I'm not in touch. I'm still considered totally toxic. P we call that Even PNG, persona non grata. So, yeah, that's me. Yeah. Yeah, that's me. I'm persona non grata because even though there is pretty widespread acceptance at this point that I was right about everything – there's still a sort of general feeling of, yeah, but you shouldn't have said it because it was controversial and you're unpredictable and you won't take orders and you won't, you know, what might you do if given yeah. responsibility again? Don't, don't you think you it's might... weird that uh, 
the the general sense that I get from the left or people who were duped by all this is that we all just got lucky. We were all just lucky to know that uh, ramping up a vaccine on a on a novel virus probably interrupts nature a little bit. That covering kids' mouths and when when they're learning how to fucking speak is not necessarily the best idea. Or keeping them out of school for two years. These are all very obvious things rooted in yeah. in science. And but yep. the, the general sense seems to be that we all just got lucky, uh, and next time we won't or whatever, right? It, there, there's no, not that I don't think anybody's out there asking for credit. Well, there probably are some assholes, but nobody's looking for credit. Just like, hey, the epistemology of our society requires that there is a true north. Like this is right and this is wrong, and here's how we determine those things. Because otherwise, we're just operating under chaos with no rules whatsoever. Like it, we we have government and infrastructure, but no actual rules. You know what I mean? Which means yeah. the rules can be selectively applied by whomever's well, in power. Well, and that's exactly what happened. You know, emergency orders. I mean, Gavin Newsom, I think, still retains emergency powers in California. What yeah, until emergency? May, I think. Yeah, or, or... it's until May. Like what? What emergency? The emergency? There's no emergency. But you know, once you get that much power and you can make laws without legislating, you can just make them because you feel like it while doing whatever you want on your own. Because we all know, at least Californians tracked it very closely. You know, he was sending his own kids to private mm -hmm. school. He was eating dinner at French Laundry for eight hundred dollars a meal, um, hobnobbing with lobbyists. And you know, he got to do whatever he wanted. Uh, but he retained these, you know, emergency powers and continues to retain them. I mean. They just re-implemented mass mandates in Marin County, which is north of San Francisco, for elementary school mm -hmm. students, despite all evidence through the Cochrane study, et cetera, that they really do nothing. They just did it again. I mean, it's like an identity at this point. Um, but as far as getting lucky, now I'm sort of losing my train of thought. I mean, when you say we got lucky, do you mean that more people didn't? No, no, no. I, I mean that leftists in the United States mm. who have been duped by all this stuff think oh, that I see. they think that um, I guess I'm not particularly conservative, but they think that conservatives and people who are anti mandates and anti vaccination, they thought they just got lucky. Like you just happened to be right this time. Oh, I don't even think they've gone there. Honestly, I think they I mean, the people, the really like far, far left mm. people in San Francisco, they still think like all the people in Florida are dead. I mean, quite literally, they think like everybody died in Florida, um, which is false. And when you normalize for age and it, 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 they did better than California, mm. but they believe the headlines that the New York Times and CNN spewed wrongly um for two and a half three years they believe the fear mongering so i don't even think they think they got lucky i think they think they're idiots who demanded freedom um and don't care about community and safety and they're selfish they're selfish jerks that's what they think at least you know the far left there's still a huge contingent that believes that i'm not surprised that I mean, are I, not my friends yeah, that yeah. don't talk to me i lived in uh oakland well i lived in piedmont oh, okay. for a long time oh, okay. um and worked in san francisco for homeland security and then private security for a while um and it's you know when i first got there it was 2011 i think and it was super nice you know there was there are the same the general issues that you see in any city, Hunter's Point is a is a fucking gang war center, and the Tenderloin has oh, an open air drug market back then. But most oh, of the it's city, worse now. oh, I know, I, I know it is. But yeah. well, actually, it's all of the city now is basically an open air drug. That's market. right. Um, That's right. But yeah, it used to be like um, I really enjoyed going to Little Italy and just traveling up and down Green Street. Uh, Soda Mari's there. It's one of the best Chipino places in the world. Now, like it's just it's fucked. Like one of the it's, nicest cities in the world is completely fucked now. I could not agree with you more. I, you know, I moved there in 1992. I loved it. And I, you know, what I loved about it also was it was like, if you'd ever felt like a weirdo, it was sort of, it was so welcoming. It was just whoever you were, whatever you thought, everyone was welcome. Even though it was expensive, you could do it. You know, I was just out of college. You could live with three mm. roommates in an apartment and kind of have a life there. Um, but it was a home for dissidents in a sense. And now it's just a place of such utter conformity. You have to agree with every single, take every box of the Democratic Party 
platform orthodoxy, et cetera, or you are a heretic and must be banished. And then you add on top of that, the cost of living is, as you know, it, it, incredibly excessive. And at every turn, you're just met with drug dealers and, you know, the streets are popular. There's a, there's a football field sized open air drug market right in front of city hall mm-hmm. tents like that's city hall and you know the downtown area because it has the lowest return to office rate of any city in the country no one will go back to work after covid half of the businesses downtown are closed so that just makes it you know a ghost town except for the homeless and the drug addicted and crime is rampant in in the last few months i was there I had to call 911 three times. I was walking my six, five-year-old daughter to the playground and I thought there was somebody dead on the street from an overdose. Mm-hmm. Like you could see the kit and everything. How is this humane? This is not a humane way to treat the law-abiding citizens or the people who are suffering from addiction and mental health challenges that are living on the streets. It's gross. And yet they pretend that if you have an issue with it, that you are the bad one, that you are, you know, you know, they pretend being homeless is a lifestyle choice that we have to respect. Yeah, that's uh, isn't that interesting? It's like, I guess it's part and parcel with what's been going on in the broader culture uh, that any kind of uh, limitation you might have or a mistake you might make is uh, diffused as someone else's fault or certainly not yours, whether it's society at large's fault or whatever. Um, but then instead of treating mental illness the way we have forever, which is to say treating it, now we tell yeah. people just to embrace their mental illness. And like, oh, it's that's that's are. just that's who you are. That's fucking crazy. It's awful. It's not your authentic self. Um, it's deranged. It's inhumane to allow these people to suffer, to live on the streets um, without you know, healthcare, water, food, I mean, it, it, to allow them essentially to commit slow moving suicide. It, it's, it's just grotesque. And, and, you know, despite the fact that I've lived there for over 30 years, and I loved it for many, many, and I never had an issue with, you know, I knew the homeless people that were in my neighborhood, I brought them food, like, it's not that I have this, like, it, I never lived in the sort of gated type communities where I wanted to be walled off from the world, I was of a part of my community. But It just got so over the top. I mean, that is not normal to have to walk to the playground and call 911 Mm. because you think somebody is dying on the street and you just watch 12 other people walk by and not care at all. But this has been going on in major cities for a long time since the 70s and 80s really where uh, I don't know if it's just white politicians who think they don't have the right to go into those places and be like, Hey, this is all fucked up. We got to fix this or something. Right. Cause Baltimore is like that. South Chicago is like that. And ha- they both have been for a very long time. This is nothing. Yeah. LA is now too. Yeah. yeah. LA so, is bad. Too. So what, what do you think that is? I mean, um, I, I don't get it from a humanity perspective. Why? Like if, if, if it was a member of your family, you wouldn't behave that way. If a member of your family no. was sleeping out on your doorstep, shooting up That's heroin right. every morning, you would do something about it. You would, uh, at, at very worst, obviously disown them, but you would at least try to get them help and not just say, hey, you know what? That's just, that's Uncle fucking Ricky out there. That's how he is. No big deal to step yeah. over his fucking bleeding body. Uh, like, right. what, what kind of way to treat people is that? Yeah, I think it's, you know, as many woke policies have it's sort of wokeness gone awry and it ends up being you know absolutely destructive you know the underlying principle i guess i would argue if i was trying to understand it is um it's somehow anti-low income it's anti-poor it's anti-folks who have fallen on hard times to be critical of them for being on the streets it's anti you know, people with it's stigmatizing of people with mental illness and and drug problems to say, this is a problem, we need to arrest them. And, you know, look, I don't, no one should be stigmatized, but they need to get the help that they need. Mm. You know, there's a writer for I think it's for SF gate, he he was homeless and a heroin addict for and fentanyl for for three years. And he said he was handed in his three years on the street, and he didn't get clean until he went to prison, he was handed, you know, equipment that he could shoot up with Mm. safely he was handed um you know a card for place he could go that he could shoot up safely he was never once approached 
with any kind of help. Like, here's a place you could go that people can help you get clean and get your life back. And he didn't until he went to prison, which he is ultimately grateful for, um, because that is what kind of woke him up. But I don't know. I think it's this idea that we don't want to discriminate. Like, the discrimination is the worst thing in the world, and it's discriminatory to say homelessness is bad. I, I, I mean, honestly, it's such a twist. The mental gymnastics you mm. have to do to get there, but I do think that's what it is. Yeah, I, And despite right. the fact that... Despite the fact that the policies they keep putting into place aren't working, they just keep doubling down on the same failed policies. You know what the uh, the truly ironic part about that is that the uh, the harder you try not to discriminate in those kind of situations, the more discriminatory you end up becoming. Right? It's, it's like uh, you mentioned it earlier, where when you were doing activism in the late two thousands surrounding gymnasts and things like that, uh, you weren't. It wasn't cool to advocate. Uh, uh, for certain things. And then when you, when it came to school children later on, um, you know, the rich kids are fine, but if you ab- advocate for black and brown kids now it becomes a problem, right? It's like you're shining a light on how discriminatory the system has become and that's offensive that's to people. And I think it's the same thing from my perspective with the gun debate. We talk about rifles so much in the gun debate and they account for less than 2% of all gun deaths, including suicides, right? All rifles, not just the quote unquote assault rifle, while 70% of gun deaths happen in inner cities and gang fights with handguns. Right. And we completely ignore that issue because it's not sexy, but that, that, that becomes intrinsically discriminatory because now these people in these neighborhoods, not just the ones committing the offenses, but everyone around them is suffering because we're too afraid to look racist, to solve, to help these people solve their problems. That's that, that's super fucked up. It, yeah, I like the way you put it. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in terms of the, the, the public schools and advocating for their opening, you know, in the, in the fall of 20, when it became clear they weren't going to open, but the privates did. And at this point, there started to be articles written. So I thought, okay, now is, is the time. I'm actually going to write a proposal. And I'm going to say, maybe we could weigh in and do an op-ed in the local paper or something saying, our employees can't work. We can't run our business. The school kids are suffering. Like, because we had done stuff like that in the mm-hmm. past. Now, I was the only executive with kids in public school, but I was senior enough. I said, I'd be the face of it. Like, can we do this? We do shit like this all the time. <laughs> um, the reason that they gave as a no, we cannot, is our kids all go to private school in person, so it will make us look bad. So, again, to your point, it would expose that hypocrisy. But what like, it, it would be like, hey, our kids are doing fine, so now we're trying to help your kids. That's how I would read it. Me too. Um, but they're afraid of looking like elitist, privileged elitist, because that's not cool anymore. And I'm like, but who on earth thinks an executive is not a privileged elitist? Like, it, this reveals nothing new. Everybody mm. knows you're super rich. It's all publicly available information. So advocating around racial equality and you're not black, like, why do you have to be the thing? Isn't it more empathetic than to try to help and, you know, allow people um, what you have? Mm-hmm. basic right to an education but they're afraid of being revealed as hypocrites you know they want to put the in this house we believe sign in their yard and have that be enough and be done and say see sure. i'm a good person but not actually do anything the the purpose of uh power is to leverage it in the service of others right that that is uh um something that i really believe uh power, wealth, whatever it is. I mean, the more of whatever, the more of it you have, the more responsibility you take on to be a good steward of it and also to be a good steward of your community. Um, And what I see now is just rampant moral cowardice. I I used to think people were just stupid. Now I know that they're fucking cowards, which is way worse to me. I would rather them be stupid. It might be a little of both, but I think you're right. It's mostly cowardice. People would rather stand with the tribe and, you know, wave their sort of morally virtuous whatever flag with the tribe, then stand apart and do the right thing. And I think that's probably 70 to 80 percent of people in the world across Mm. time and geography. And it is it's cowardice. That's all it is. And not something you would expect from uh, tier one leaders in corporate America, because they've been pretty ballsy through the years in a lot of ways. And now not so much, right? Well, I, 
I'm not so sure they have been pretty ballsy. I mean, they might be in terms of, you know, product innovation and that mm. kind of thing. But I, I think in terms of these sorts of issues, no. And it all sort of comes down to just their main priority is to make a lot of money. I think I what I thought in the past is that leaders across any sector, whether it was, you know, or what I hoped to say thought might be a stretch, but, you know, the leaders across corporate, you know, business, government, that they – they were more likely to not be cowards. They were more likely to try to do the right thing and to kind of lead. And I actually think that percentage of 80%, it, it holds true amongst leaders, regular folks. Like it's just the same, any country, any tier, any level of employment, it's the same. 80% of people would rather be with the crowd. They look right and left to see what their friends are doing before they say what they think. And that's just the way it is. And I don't think it's changeable. Mm. I think that is human nature. Well, maybe the question is, how did so many of the 80% get into these positions of extreme power, right? Because usually when you talk about C-level people, I mean, there are some jobs like operations officers and things like that aren't necessarily huge risk takers. But CEOs are risk takers. That That's the only way you get into a position like that. Founders are. Not uh, yeah, CEOs, fair enough. Regular. Fair enough, yeah. So, so how did we, uh, do you think that it's just a sycophant culture or what, what, what is it? Yeah, it, they're sycophants. They care about money first and foremost, no matter what they tell you, nobody makes $40 million if that's not their main goal. And they will do anything to protect that wealth. Mm. If that means I have to pretend I'm a social justice warrior, you know, and they all sort of grease each other's palms and you've got, everyone's fully aligned, you know, between the, the corporations, now we see government and sort of government influencing big tech to censor everyday citizens. And the press has lined up as well to kind of champion these people they perceive. So it's this closed loop system where everybody is just supporting, that's a nice way to put it, kind yeah. of each other and the message. And no one's kind of holding anyone to account. I mean, I, I have a huge issue with the press at this point. Like what happened to holding power to account? What happened to interrogating the issues? They have literally, for the last three years, printed as news, government-issued press releases, mm. pharma-issued press releases. That is not news. If I could read a study from Pfizer and click on the footnotes and figure out that the vaccine never was tested on whether it prevented infection, I, me, and of course people say, oh, you're not an expert. I know how to click a link and read numbers. I'm yeah. not a moron. And the pre no one in the press ever did it. They literally just published, you know, press releases as if they were news. And so, you know, that is really a new and because then that convinces the masses. Sure. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I think what it takes to become a CEO, as I moved my way up the ladder, and I was always a reluctant kind of corporate employee, it wasn't something I ever wanted. And I always thought, well, once I get into the room where it happens, I'll be impressed with the thought process. <laughs> like they must be really, yeah. and I'd get there and I'd be like, no, everyone's, no, no one's thinking for themselves. They look right and left before they make a comment. Um, I think most of the time people that succeed in corporate America are good, like good at following rules. They're good rule followers. Mm. You know, they work hard, they show up on time, they tick the boxes, you know, maybe pretty decent at math you know, in a business setting, but not creative thinkers, not courageous leaders, not particularly ethical or moral, don't even kind of factor that into the equation of their thinking. They're just sort of good little soldiers. Mm. That's when you go from, as a company, when you go from providing value to simply extracting wealth from your customers, right? That's right. That's that's Agreed. that's usually that's what's happening. I mean, typically in, in throughout economic history, that's been kind of the death throes of a company. But it seems like now just because of, you know, what I consider to be corporate fascism, you know, just uh, yeah, I agree. The, the alignment between government and, and corporations these days. Uh, yeah. Th thanks, Mitt Romney, for that one, by the way, um, is it, it's anytime you. <laughs> When, I don't like the phrase too big to fail, but anytime you save a company yeah. from some, some from pain it should be feeling, uh, yes. one, they're just going to take that risk again. Like we see the subprime mortgage thing that crashed our economy is still happening right now. It's literally yeah. still in the identical way. It's still happening. 
Um, yeah. So you don't learn a lesson. You just like, well, the government will bail us out if everything goes wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, you know, I think, again, I know I keep pointing to Sam Bankman fried It's just such a recent example, but it's a great example. He was, you know, pretending to be this, you know, woke warrior. And he said he did it because it made people like him. And he was raiding the company's coffers and he never provided any um, good or service of any value. What I, you know, Elizabeth Holmes, same thing with Theranos. Um, there are scores more examples. And what I don't understand and what I do think ultimately will happen, but it will take time, you know, the banks, Goldman, JP Morgan, they don't like being fooled by these people because they are losing money. And again, they are in business to make money, but they bought in. They bought into WeWork and they bought into all these companies. And eventually they're going to stop being suckers, I think. And they're going to say, you know what? I want to see your p and I mm. want to focus on the fundamentals. I don't want to hear about how you're saving the world. I want to know what product it is you are going to provide to consumers that they are going to buy that will provide sustainable growth. But because they they look like idiots, right? They invested in these people because mm. they bought their story. And so I think ultimately the desire to make money will prevail and we will have to get back to the fundamentals and the, the foundational, you know, tenets of capitalism, which is make a great product, mm. price it fairly, take care of your employees, period. You know, we're going to have to, but I think we're a ways away. Um, yeah, I mean, I, what concerns me is, as I mentioned before, the disillusion of the uh, epistemology of, of, the, of the West, like what, it, what, what real means, you know what I mean? Um, there's a quote from Game of Thrones. I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's something like when enough people make false promises, words stop meaning anything. And then all you're left yeah. with are better and better lies. And that's how you get yeah. duped into a Sam Bankman freed or to a shitty oh. product or to whatever, right? I, I completely agree. And I think this is happening. Or cr this is what concerns me. And it's why I would not sign the non-disclosure agreement because I, I refuse to further a lie. The lie that I was told I needed to further is that you had to have public schools closed. It wasn't harming children. They were fine. They were resilient. And anyone who wanted the movement was a racist. That's a lie, which, as you said, anyone with common sense knows. And yet they convinced themselves it was true. And they carried that lie. Everyday citizens carried that lie. But we see it across the board, across a range of issues. I mean, I don't want to kind of go down the rabbit hole here, but like the idea that biology does not exist everyone knows that's not true that's a lie mm. but people will twist themselves in knots to carry it forward as a truth to further an ideology the idea that healthy at any size yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a lie but not only will people a, engage in that stuff they will participate in the delusion there are that's right there are people who don't have anything approaching uh, uh gender dysphoria who have their pronouns in their bio uh, like I ask anytime I see that and somebody's trying to talk shit to me online or something that I don't even answer their question. I'm just like, why are there pronouns in your bio? You're very clearly a woman. Like what, what, what is the purpose it's, of that? They're like, Oh, it's to validate them. Like what the fuck well, does that so mean? Interesting. Yeah. I mean, in corporate, like, would America, you put white, we, if, the, if, if we're going to start identifying as racist too, <laughs> and uh, an Asian person wants to identify as white, do I have to put white in my bio? Just to let them know no, that it's okay bad. for them to identify themselves to you? Like, shut the fuck up. You, no, you can't do that because then you'd be identified as a white supremacist. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we were told, to, we were strongly encouraged, and at this point they probably require it, to put pronouns in our email signature sign up, and I just sort of quietly rejected it. Mm. Um, I mean, I had, I had two, I think, trans people on my team treat everyone equally, do a great job, we're all good, I, it's fine. But why do I have to announce something that is patently obvious? That's compelled speech. Mm -hmm. I worked at Levi's 23 years. I had four children there. They saw me pregnant. <laughs> saw, I mean, like, you know what I am. Mm -hmm. I don't need to say it. And and I, I won't sort of be part of furthering that delusion, to your point. And the body positivity one is another one. You know, we are forced to, one of the things I was um, lambasted for is saying, you know, obesity is linked to poor health outcomes with COVID and I was called in front of the whole company, a fat phobe and blaming the victim. It's like, but it is, it's that, that's a fact. 
And, mm. you know, we're yet yeah, we're forced to say, no, you can be perfectly healthy at any size and all food is neutral and there is no bad food. It's bullshit. Um, and the only one that really benefits are big pharma, because now, of course, there's going to be a pill that you can take and it'll be OK to talk about it. Yeah. But you can't. You well, know, everybody, everybody's on Ozempic now. Um, oh, everybody. Which is, is interesting. You know, it's uh, every now time we can talk about it. Every, yeah. Every time we. Um, we think we can outsmart nature. It just doesn't seem to go well. It's almost like all of these things, the, the binary nature of life, that is to say there are histamines and then antihistamines. I can eat local honey and the bees fly around and interact with all the histamines and then they produce stuff that will inoculate me to them. It's almost like we're symbiotic with our environment, right? Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. And you, I, I completely agree with you. And when we, but, but I do think that's what public health thinks. Public health as an entity and an organization, they think that we can beat nature. We can live forever. We can just take more drugs and have more surgeries and we can be whatever gender we want. We can be whatever weight we want. And we can live forever. Well, public um, health is turning that into a product though. I don't, they don't actually believe uh, yeah. that shit. They're just turning it into a product. That's all it is. I think, I think a lot of them do believe it. Well, they they may have deluded themselves into believing it, but I don't think they began that way. I think it's it's about productizing these things. Like like you said, I mean, I think, far, the pharmaceutical yeah. industry has always been like that. They're not going to – if they had a, a single pill that cured every single disease, you would never fucking hear about it. That's for sure. No, that is correct. Yeah, I mean, I it's hard to say chicken egg, you know, and mm. it's hard to know. I think there are true believers in, in any kind of – and then I think there's a lot of people that kind of carry the water, you know, the, the true believers carry water. And then there are people with uh, less noble intentions. I don't know. I don't know which are worse, but, <laughs> you know, at any rate, I agree with you. We cannot look, there's amazing things that have happened from medicine and science. Antibiotics are a mm -hmm. wonder, right? Like that is a great, amazing thing. But we also know when you use it too much, it causes real harm. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing the harms of that with, you know, antibiotic biotic resistant staff and MRSA and all of these things. So well, not just that, but way. also, uh, you know, all the, all the serotonin in your body is created in your gut. And if your gut health right. is fucked up, exactly. you're going to become sued. That, that, that's uh, not not entirely, but largely to blame for right. uh, all the suicidal stuff with younger kids, especially these days. Well, and I think autoimmune issues are mm. linked to it and all, you know, which we see just, you know, going crazy. Oh, yeah. RS, RSV women. has been really bad the last two years because of, you know, not, not being exposed to anything for the previous the, two years. The, yeah. The immunity mm. debt, which now they say is not real. I mean, it's completely insane. You know, at the beginning of COVID and to some extent now they, they, they literally further this lie that um, natural immunity is a conspiracy theory. What? Mm. How, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's a thing that exists like, gravity well you know I mean, the, the weirdest the weirdest part about it that is the video of fauci in 2019 saying that why would you get a vaccine for a virus you've already had you know what i mean it's like you can't you could i, I can be tricked just like anybody else anybody can be tricked but you can't trick me if you've already said the opposite thing you know what I mean? Well, that's what's crazy. And there's video of them saying all of this. Mm. Like, even now, Fauci said just a couple months ago, I had nothing to do with the school closures. I mean, he didn't literally shut them. I mean, he mm. didn't have the power to make that decision, but he did everything in his power to further fear to ensure that they were closed. You know, I, everybody wants to distance themselves. And yet the video exists, to your point. I mean, the video exists of every, you know, of Fauci, Walensky, all of them saying, Rachel Maddow saying, if you get vaccinated, you will not get COVID. You cannot get infected and you cannot spread it. And yet now they say, we never said that. Mm. And that's why that's I think, that, I think that's why they were so, uh, that's why this became the time in American history where the social media censorship really stepped up. I think that's yeah. why, because it's typically been, uh, the creator class, whomever that happens to be, that holds power to account alongside the media sometimes. Yeah. But a lot of it happens because of activism from the creator class, artists, entertainers, things like that. And, um, you know, the the Hollywood crowd was pretty lockstep. Only oh, a few yeah. only a few people walked out of line. 
but the online creator community really went after a lot of this bullshit and they had the receipts. They were able to edit video yeah. for our oh, gra yeah. grab a video and, and cover it from years ago. And um, I think that's why the censorship got so rampant this time. I think that's right. I think that's right. And there was just such an intense effort for the legacy media you know, to follow orders and print the press releases and anything that sort of risked piercing that had mm. to be banished. I mean, they, they manufactured a consensus that this is what all actors think. Anyone who doesn't think it is a, you know, right wing fringe lunatic. It doesn't matter if you worked at Stanford your whole life and you're one of the world's premier uh, vaccine safety experts like Dr. Bhattacharya or if you mm. worked at Harvard like Martin Kohler, it doesn't matter. And all of those people were black blacklisted, silenced. Um, and there was a manufactured consensus created by the legacy media. And to your point, you had all these creators going, hey, no, wait, wait, wait. And they had to be shunted mm. to the side as well. You could not pierce the narrative. And I think to this day, a lot of people still think we're crazy. Well, I mean, Google is actually stepping up its efforts now to censor stuff, which is odd on the other side of... Uh, a losing PR campaign to double down on what you were already doing. Um, but I guess they don't really give a shit, right? I mean, a Amazon and Google for, for sure, those two companies, they don't really care. No, they don't. And it's the, when I say, uh, when I, the reason I brought up the creator class is because I wanted to ask you this, uh, as somebody like San Francisco is a pretty hip city to live in. I enjoyed being there. Um, a lot of culture, a lot of, uh, entertainment comes through there. Uh, it's not like LA, you know, it's a different, like you said, it's kind of weird. Different I, vibe. I live in Austin now. It's more like Austin than it is yeah. LA for sure. Totally agree. Um, yeah. But do you have any thoughts on why we went, why or how, I guess we went in a single generation from artists saying things like, fuck you, don't do what they tell you to fuck you, do what they tell you. I, it's very bizarre that the counterculture side of things has shifted to the right i i don't know that we've seen that it in, has and in, 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 in american society i don't think we've ever seen that actually no i agree with you i mean it used to be yeah i mean like rock and roll was i i i try to you have know, people like neil young who are you know pulling their music off spotify this is a guy who sort of was all about challenging um the man and now he's like if you don't go along with what the man says you're a bad person it's like conformity is demanded from the left why has that happened and you know that flip has been utterly completed in the last few years and the left is the most conformist and demanding of conformity I, I, i'm not sure i totally know i think there's this i think it is tied to the culture of safetyism um that young people have been raised within and that you know my generation xers raise their kids not me but most you know in this world they wanted to prevent any harm and any discomfort and it's as if now these young people you know every time they take offense it's like a grave social injustice and they've grown up with safe spaces in universities and they really think they deserve to never have to have a hard conversation mm. that that is some sort of grave social injustice and they bring that into the workplace and the leaders the older people like myself are afraid of these young people because you know they're active online and the old folks don't really know how to manage that or what it means or what it doesn't mean um but i i, th I, I think it's related to this notion of safetyism um and sort of just demanding comfort and safety and valuing that above freedom. I, you know, I try to imagine a world in which when I was a young person, when I was 20 years old, that, you know, my university told me I couldn't leave my room and I obeyed. Like, I never would have done that. Mm -hmm. I would have said, fuck off, I'm going to a party. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that we kind of depend on youth for that, don't we? I mean, it, it's 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 typically been every generation looks at the upcoming generation like, oh, man, back in my day, you wouldn't have been able to do that or whatever the fuck or. Uh, I agree. Now it's I think like they're, they're not dry. Everybody is. It's like they collectively all sighed and, and f like fell back into their beanbag chairs and they're just comfortable lying there as shiftless layabouts. Uh, you know, I'm, I guess I'm getting a little Andy Rooney here now, but. Uh, <laughs> It's like the, I will say, yeah, yeah I mean, the generation gets a bad rap and I have two kids, I have 22 and a 19 year old. And I think they get a bad rap as being sort of like, like you said, lazy lie abouts and 
look, I had a ton of Gen Z's that worked for me that were hard. I don't mm. want to kind of dismiss an entire generation that were hardworking. My kids are very hardworking, always hold a job. I just, it's the conformity that I find alarming um, because you're right. That is what we rely on youth for. And yet at the same time, they're conforming. They think that they're rebels. You know, they all use hashtag resist in their profiles and they think they're resisting some force that they've never seen or met. I don't know what this force is that they're resisting. It's, you know, people in Texas or something. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> I a, that's a neat trick though. If you're in power and trying to keep power, um, mitigating, uh, 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 subversion is not the worst idea, I guess. And if you can trick the people who are in power with you into yeah. thinking that they're not in power and they have to fight for that more power, that's a pretty good strategy. Yeah. yeah that they're the underdog fighting for what's right. Yeah, I don't know. Fighting against for the last two years, forces. they've held both houses of Congress and the presidency, and somehow they're still resisting. I'm not sure exactly whom. I know. I, you know, even before all of this, I would get really annoyed um, when people would use good trouble, you know, in their, in their profile, their hashtag, they'd use the, you know, the, that phrase. And I'm, I was always like, you're no trouble at all. You literally don't know a person who disagrees with you on anything. You won't even have a conversation with a person that mm. disagrees with you. What kind of trouble are you? Well, they'll show Zero up and destroy trouble. their own neighborhood though, right? To, to, to the detriment of their own neighborhood and not, not the actual people that are causing them the problems, which is interesting. Yeah. Most people won't. They think they're good trouble because they posted a black square on Instagram, <laughs> but they sit home and do nothing. And, right, they, yeah. you know, that's most people. Mm -hmm. You know, they, like I said, they use a yard sign saying, in this house we believe, and they do their black square and they buy a T-shirt from name the company with a rainbow logo on it, and that's how they're good trouble. How is that good trouble? You've literally done nothing. You've done absolutely nothing. Um, and what are you resisting? Who do you know? Like if you were resisting and you think there are all these bad people out there that don't believe in those things, that don't believe that all people should be treated with respect mm. and, you know, have a quality of opportunity, then go find the ones that don't think it and talk to them and try to convince them. Sitting there and like jabbering with your friends who all agree with you about how evil Ron DeSantis is and how all the people in Florida are evil. What? You've never met them. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? It's a total, so I mean, it reminds me of uh, just having conversations with people on cocaine, to be honest. Uh, it's just like, you're both saying dumb shit because you're high. I think these people are just, <laughs> I think they're dumb and high out of their fucking minds and have no idea what they're talking about. That's honestly what I think. That's really, yeah, it's funny. I mean, I think it's like a religion. It's like mm -hmm. a new religion, which I know is not a new idea, but with, you know, mass secularization, people haven't lost the religious impulse. They sure. still want to belong to something. They still want to believe in something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And they still want to believe that they hold the moral high ground. And so those aggressive conversations with people that violently agree with you is a way of sort of signaling sure. that you are morally right. But I think that's a good impulse because you, but you, to, to want to be part of something bigger, obviously, is a good impulse. But I think wanting to have the moral high ground is as well. Uh, the problem is that when you stop there, right, when you just say, well, my position, you, you start to conflate your position with the moral high ground instead of having to actually climb to the moral high ground. You know what I mean? Like that's the, yeah. the reason that that like biological impetus exists is because nature wants us on the moral high ground. That's why it's not, yes. it's not just to claim victory like George no, W. Bush with, with the mission accomplished stuff. No, I agree with that. I think that the other part of a religious impulse is you want sort of a framework around kind of what is good and what is bad behavior. Like, how do I achieve this mm. moral high ground? And I think COVID provided that for a lot of people. Good sure. people stay home. Good people isolate their children. Good people wear 27 masks all the time and hate other people. And when you have this framework, it allows you to commit atrocities that are clearly horrible, discriminatory human rights mm. violations. But because you're in the framework and you're worshiping the right God, the science, Fauci, whatever it is, it, 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 it permits all sorts of atrocities, which I think in hindsight we'll see as terrible atrocities. I mean, we let people die alone in the hospital. Women gave birth alone. Like, what? Mm. We locked old people in their dying days in a room by themselves. They died from loneliness and isolation. Like, these are just, it's so cruel. But it was justified because it kind of fit the moral framework. And the false gods being worshipped said it was necessary. Sure.
Yeah, I mean, all the uh, worst things that happened in human history were right uh, in the name. Of- yeah, in the name of something good, I guess. Uh, crazy, yeah, crazy stuff. Well, look, I really appreciate you coming today. This has been very informative. It's nice to know that. Um, at least at some point there were C level executives at major companies that weren't fucking dummies, um, or cowards, uh, either one. Um, you've, you've written a book. Uh, tell me about that and where people can find it. Yeah. I wrote a book uh, called Levi's Unbuttoned, which is about a lot of the stuff we just talked about in my final two years of conflict at the company, but it was also about coming up with the company and just sort of being a woman in corporate America in the nineties and two thousands. It's a memoir. Um, And it's a sort of musing on woke capitalism and how we got to it. Like, why did this happen? Um, And why is it bad? So you can buy it where books are sold, Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, or direct from the publisher at levisunbutton.com. And it's ebook, audio, Mm. regular book, whatever you like. It's all there. Did you read your own audio book? I did. Good. It's always weird hearing somebody. I mean, if it's like a, uh, a novel, that makes sense, but. A if, memoir. That was the thing. I thought it would be weird since it's a memoir yeah. to have someone else's voice. It's difficult, though, to read it yourself. I mean, it's I know, pretty yeah. – um, it, it's um, <laughs> it just takes a lot of discipline and a lot of time, and it's hard to read out loud for four hours in a row and not make a ton of mistakes. Yeah, big time. <laughs> cool. Uh, is there anything else you would like to share with the audience before we get out of here? No. I mean, check out the book. I would be honored if you did. Um, I also, I keep a, I write a sub stack that say mm-hmm. everything, as you mentioned in mm-hmm. the beginning. So, you know, more musings on woke capitalism sure. and why it's a terrible thing. If you're, you're interested, Your biggest out. social media presence is Twitter, right? Yeah. And it's just your sure. name, Jennifer Say, S-E-Y. He's, yep. That was my big mistake is I always just used my name. <laughs> yeah. I don't respond to people who use screen names. It's like, this is Twitter. This isn't fucking AOL, dude. Uh, you can use your own name. I mean, if you're not willing to stand by what you say and mm. then just go away. Yeah, I agree. Well, look, That's thanks. Thanks a lot for coming today. I really appreciate the conversation. I do too. You had great questions. I really, uh, really, really good questions. Interesting. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, and thanks. Thank you all for uh, listening. This has been citizen.